The scripture for this morning is 2 Timothy. Uh, let me find it. 2 Timothy 1, starting in verse 10, and then into this uh, two verses into chapter 2. If you need a Bible, there's a Bible in the chair pockets. And my name's Kevin. Uh, starting with verse 10. But has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I, I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. <coughs> this you know that all those in Asia have turned away from me, among, among whom are uh, Pygelus and Hermogenes. The Lord grant mercy to the household of Oniphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very zealously and found me. The Lord grant to him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day, that you know very well how many ways he ministered to me in Ephesus. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You smile every time. Yeah, so uh, greetings. And I think uh, you've seen these cards uh, on your chairs. Uh, they serve a number of purposes. Uh, one, on the back, you'll see that uh, there's uh, Louise's email address. Unfortunately, she's not here. Uh, she's not traveling with me this time. But uh, she sends out an, an e-letter, and she also has a blog. If you're interested in receiving news from her, just uh, send her off an email. And she'll be glad to put you on that list to keep you informed. Uh, similarly for myself, I send out um, a, uh, an e-letter. And if you'd like to uh, stay current on things uh, so that you can pray to more knowledgeably, just uh, send me off a, um, an, uh, yeah, the, uh, the, to the address right here, an email, and I'll be glad to put you on that list. Um, if during the, uh, the message you get bored, um, you can color in the uh, picture on this side. I told you this card serves uh, many purposes, uh, like the pastor in Lancaster did. So he thought this was very humorous and uh, ended up putting it up on his uh, kitchen calendar. But it was a friend of ours from Lancaster who drew this. He's an art uh, teacher. And, uh, you know, so just kind of thought it was a lot of fun. But uh, this morning, I have a couple people here and would like to share with you about impacting people. Okay, I want to talk about impacting people from the future by investing in people today. Okay, so we want to impact people from the future by investing in people today. And um, okay, I, I like science fiction. Uh, and these, uh, I don't know if you can, how well you can see that, but uh, these are science fiction movies through the ages, okay? So uh, Outer Limits, Back to the Future, Doctor Who, with the, Doctor Who just kind of spanned, uh, I think it's the longest running show ever. It's, that's right, <laughs> the TARDIS. Um, you know, the, the new... Star Trek, you know, it, it, we, we see these, uh, these different generations, and maybe you connect with some of those, maybe you don't like science fiction at all, but, you know, wh what it shows us is that things change, okay, not just black and white to color, but, uh, you know, there, there's lots and lots and lots of change in this world. And so this morning, we're going to take a look at three passages, once again, about in, in, in impacting people from the future, and we're going to look at multiplying disciples, so that's Matthew 28. Reproducing gifted servants, that's Ephesians 4, and we're going to begin with really a how-to text, which is uh, 2 Timothy 2, 
2. And there we see that Paul is talking about future generations. Now, generations, huge topic today. Uh, I was talking with uh, Eli, and I said, yeah, you know, he's the, the old new guy who is a millennial. He, you know, said, wanted me to, to know that. And uh, generations today are in the news, all right? Because from what I understand, uh, what I've read, it's the first time ever that we've got four generations in the workplace in the same office at the same time, okay? And uh, so you can see the, you know, the dates are approximations, but uh, you can find out, you know, generally to what generation you belong to. Builders, boomers, Xers, millennials. And these four generations working together, I mean, they have differing attitudes, differing values, uh, differing thoughts about issues, vital issues, really, like attitude toward work, okay? So... Builders, a little bit hard to see that, but, uh, you know, the builders, I mean, they're just known for being hard workers, okay? So, uh, the, you know, work hard. Boomers, live to work, my generation. Xers, work to live. And then millennials, work holistically, okay? So, broad gener uh, generalizations, but attitude toward responsibility and leadership. Now, this is interesting in the workplace, also for, for someone who leads teams of people, um, so here we see uh, attitude toward responsibility or leadership. The builders, I'm here to serve. And they, they just come across as looking really, really good. Um, boomers, I'm here to take over. All right, I can, I can pick on my own generation. But Xers, you've got to earn it. Millennials, I deserve it. Okay, sorry, millennials, you know, entitlement, the whole thing. But some of them tell me that, yeah, it's probably not too far from the truth. Okay, so I have two millennials, you know, so I, I, I understand. New technology. Okay, so take a look at this one and figure out, what, do you remember this technology as being new? All right. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and it, okay, so... Anybody remember rotary phones? Yeah, okay, yeah. I'm, I'm not alone. We had one at home when I was a kid. You know, and, but all of these, I mean, this one is, is it's just, this one's just huge. Uh, that was the first, from what I understand, the first mobile phone. Uh, not very portable. And, you know, but all of this was, was new technology. And so, you know, things, things, things have changed very rapidly over the years you know, these, these past uh, few decades. Now, just imagine, we're, we're gonna send a millennial back in time to the 60s, all right? And a builder, you know, somebody from that, uh, that, that first generation is lost and, and wants to figure out how, how, how do I get from here to Columbus? Okay, so not really difficult, but you know, I'm not from around here, so I, I get that. And um, so the, uh, the millennial just says, well, it's easy, just Google it. Or, or better yet, use your GPS. And you know, the, the builder just looks at her and thinks, where is this person from? I don't understand anything she's saying. I don't know what a Google is. Now, I lead a team of about 40 people. And so uh, once again, a little bit hard to see, but they, you know, they go from here over to there. Uh, 10 different countries, and we have people ranging from age 66 down to 20-something, and believe me, the differences can be, and misunderstandings uh, abound. There's frustration, there's disagreement, and more. And some of the biggest conflicts, interestingly enough, are between generations that are close. You know, so if, uh, between the, uh, the Xers and the Millennials, don't always get along. And so, for myself, you know, being solid boomer generation, how can I hope to be taken seriously by people who are not like me? You know, whether it be on one side with the builders or, you know, on the other side, Xers, millennials, when we know that there are all these differing values, differing uh, impressions, differing thoughts about things. So why is all this important to you? Oh, well, you're a church going through transition. Okay. Pastor John and Sherry, 
I mean, they're, they're, oops, they're in my backyard now. You know, so uh, I see them much more often than you do. But, you know, there was, it was Pastor Jim, right, uh, you know, who was, was here, left this summer, and now you're looking at a new pastor. Who will he be? What will he be like? It was great that you were praying for him already this morning. You know, and I, I, I'm, I'm just here visiting and things like that, but, you know, I, I would very much encourage you to look younger, okay? Um, you know, I mean, you're going to walk with Christ. You know, look for somebody who's going to really be able to minister to those young people here in the church, young people in the area around. That's just, you know, my opinion. But in any case, whoever it is, you're going to be facing differences, differing expectations, possibly differing generations. This is important. And Paul has some good things to say. Let's pray. Lord, thanks for this time. Thanks for your word for how practical it is, and also for how it shows us the things that really are essential and important. And I pray that you would guide and direct, so that you would give the man of your choice, the family of your choice, to this church for the good of the church, this current generation, and for the good of the generations to come, both in the church and outside. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Impact people from the future by entrusting people today. Uh, here we see you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that's in Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, and what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men and women who will be able to teach others also. Now, be strong in grace. Grace, it means God's favor. We understand that. And it's uh, earlier in, in chapter 1, uh, he says, this, this isn't anything that we deserve. Okay, grace is a free gift. We, we don't deserve it. It's unmerited favor found in Jesus. And we can find strength in the fact that in Jesus, Jesus, he, he removes, we, we even sang that this morning, he removes our guilt, he removes our shame. And he gives to us his innocence and his honor even. He removes our shame, gives us that honor. This is saving grace. It's once and for all. Once we receive it by faith in Christ, it, we can't lose it. And Paul's talking about a second aspect of grace. It's the strength, courage, power to overcome our fears. Once again, he talks about that in chapter 1 when he says, God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love, and self-control. See, this is a kind of grace that isn't just once and done. It's, it's a kind of grace that we need to receive constantly, daily, so that we have that strength and power to overcome the obstacles to honor him in this world. And so Paul, he's saying to Timothy, okay, you're doing well. And remember, day in and day out, continue in, keep on it's, once again, something that we have to continually receive from God, this grace. Keep on being strong in the enabling power found in Jesus. So, this saving, saving grace and enabling grace, that's the prelude to Paul's explanation on how to impact people from the future. And so he says, the things you've heard from me i.e. the good deposit. So then you, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, which you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, and trust to faithful men and women who will, be, who, who will teach others also. And so this, uh, what you've heard from me, the, or earlier he calls it a good deposit. Well, it, it's essentially Paul's letters. Okay, to, today we have the New Testament, which is predominantly Paul's writings. That's the good foundational deposit. And he wants Timothy to entrust that, the things that Timothy received from Paul, to other people, faithful people. Now, entrust, it means to, you know, give something to someone else for safekeeping. And the someone else, in this case, they're the reliable people. Uh, most of our translations read, read men, but it's, it's actually a generic term. It means people, you know, men and women. And so, men and women who are worthy of trust who will faithfully entrust that word to others. 
Okay, so I'm going to just uh, take a, we're going to have a commercial break here, infomercial. Uh, Louise isn't here, but, you know, she, uh, she sends her greetings, and she edited this book. It's called A Missional Mosaic, and, uh, yeah, I can, I can take on the commercial voice. So, you can get this Missional Mosaic by simply going to Amazon.com, and uh, you can uh, just type in Missional Mosaic or Worth Project, and it'll pop to the top of the list. But it's, uh, or just this uh, easily remembered code, uh, you can type that in, <laughs> and you'll get it. But it, it's uh, 16 dif different authors' articles uh, in there. You know, I, I wrote a few uh, over and under realized ideal for women, non-authoritative, gifted women, um, both women and men. Louise wrote some. Uh, one of the best articles is by Louise where she talks about um, the parable of the talents. And I think it's entitled, What Are We Afraid Of? You know, just women who have been trusted with gifts and talents to be used by God for mission. Good read. Uh, end of commercial. All right, so back to the scripture. Chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, Paul says, Follow the pattern of sound words that you've heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. So just as Paul, he had mentored Timothy, Timothy was to mentor others. Timothy's motivation, his, his attitudes, was transformed by grace. So he was evidently living out the word. He was teaching the word to others. He was loving those with whom he was sharing the word. Now, we often forget that attitude matters. It does to God. And people pick it up. Attitude really matters. And it's, it, it's easy to slip into teaching or to serving in a way that, you know, I mean, the builder generation, they're, they're known for duty. Okay, and that's, that's a really good thing. It's commendable. But the attitude matters. Why are we doing this? And Timothy's motivation was because he loved people. The attitude matters. For the boomers, it's easy for people to become projects. You know, let's get this thing done. We're going to take that hill. Well, yeah, but 95% of us are going to die. That's okay. Let's go. You know, it, it, people aren't things. We have to remember the people and have that love for people. Xers, they're known for having an attitude. Uh, and then millennials, maybe, it, maybe it's up to you millennials to teach us you know, about good, godly attitudes. Filled with the Spirit, loving people, being faithful to the Word. And Timothy, he was supposed to look for others whose life was built on faith in Christ, whose motivation was faithfully transmitting the Word, and was doing that, who are doing that for, out of love for people. Just as Paul had faith in God, he also trusted Timothy. And so Timothy was to entrust the word to others. Now, trusting the next generation is already a problem. All right? Uh, I see it often. And once again, Xers and, and millennials, uh, they're going to tell us, the boomers, you know, we've got a problem with you. You boomers refuse to relinquish control to younger generations. I mean, just look in the business world. It, it happens all the time. The boomers still dominate. Okay? And so at work, do you recognize this gentleman? Lee Iacocca. He saved Chrysler. Okay? So he was uh, the business icon for a while. Uh, do you know who this is? Mark Zuckerberg. Known for? Facebook, yeah, okay. So, two huge people in the business world, very different generations. So, Lee Iacocca, uh, can you imagine him entrusting Chrysler to that? Okay, I mean, he, he just doesn't look the part. He's an upstart. He won't be taken seriously by upper management. He won't be taken seriously the, by the board of directors. The guy wears a t-shirt. He's too young. He doesn't have enough experience. He's not ready. You see, it, because the expectations were oh so different. Back then, it was really a different world. And yet, Zuckerberg created one of the, the, the biggest, it was, it was a phenomenon in creating Facebook. 
as Europe director, um, so I'm, I'm currently director of church planting, but I had been Europe director. And so at the time when I became director, we had 14 churches in Europe, and only two of them were led by Europeans. And, you know, they are, are my teammates and I, you know, we never intended on pastoring these churches for, long, uh, for the long term. You know, we just wanted to start them and see Europeans uh, then lead them. And so started talking with them and, uh, you know, well, why, why are you still leading that church? Let's, let's discuss this. Well, we have some potential leaders, but they're not yet ready. Well, why not? Well, then, you know, just take a look at the expectations, uh, you know, some of the, some of the reasons. And this isn't to disparage my, my teammates or even sure, myself. Uh, it's just what was going through our heads. You know, so they have no theological degree. We all did. Uh, no, their skills in preaching, yeah, they're, they're not yet honed. Um, they were generally bivocational because they didn't have the support structure that we have, churches uh, giving money to support them to do that ministry. So they couldn't assume all of the responsibilities and all the activities uh, and programs and things that we had started and were doing. Um, there are, you know, lots of reasons given. And, you know, they also weren't doing things the way we did them. And uh, so we were often confusing the way we do things as the right way. Guilty? Okay. You know, but the conclusion ended up being, well, they're not ready. Now, is that what Paul did with Timothy? You know, because I don't think that Paul required Timothy to do all that he was doing the way that he was doing his ministry. Rather, I think Paul entrusted Timothy, who did not have Paul's personality, who did not have Paul's experience, who did not have Paul's giftedness, he encouraged Timothy to nonetheless pursue the mission that Jesus had entrusted to his church by living the word, by faithfully sharing the word, by loving God and people, however Timothy saw fit. The how didn't matter. I really believe that. The how did not matter. But the what did. That faithfulness, the word, and love for people. And so Paul, he, uh, he made a leap of faith, I think, by entrusting this mission to Timothy. I mean, really, would, would you and I have entrusted the future of Christianity to Timorous Timothy? Because he, it, Timothy was known for, you know, like not being very sure of himself. Why did Paul confer this mission to his young Padawan, his apprentice? Now, you know, think about it. The, the Apostle Paul, he was the only teacher, you know, of his caliber. Actually, ever. In all of Christianity, he is the theologian. All right? And so maybe, maybe a better strategy, maybe he should have started a megachurch. I mean, just, just think about it. Today, the Apostle Paul, he could have started the Paul of Tarsus Ministries. Right? Complete with his own cable channel, YouTube channel, podcasts. I mean, maybe some of his books would have even made bestsellers. That was actually a joke. You can laugh there because, you know, like the Bible, bestseller of all time. Paul wrote most of the New Testament. Okay. My jokes don't get any better than that. So it is. But, you know, you know if, if anybody could insist on sound doctrine, it was Paul. If anybody could fear that others like young Timothy wouldn't do it right, would lack depth, it was Paul. Paul could have justifiably, justifiably said, Tim, little Timmy, nope, not ready. But his plan, his strategy to thwart heresy, because you read the rest of 2 Timothy, it's, it's all about heresy and the dangers that were there. He entrusted Timothy with the future of Christianity to protect the word, equip others, reach people from the future, by diffusing it, by spreading it far and wide through careful delegation, by mentoring people like Timothy, who would in turn do the same. See, because Paul wanted, he desperately wanted to impact future generations. So, I'm going to read this and tell me how many generations do you see in this verse, in these two verses. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. How many generations? Three? 
Any other ideas? I, I counted up four. Okay. So there's Paul. There's Timothy. The people whom Timothy would reach. And then the people that those people would reach. And really, if we, if we take a look at it, it's a, it's a whole lot more because the intent is this is to be perpetuated by entrusting that word to faithful people. And so rather than strategizing to, to win the world by himself, Paul, like Jesus, Jesus had the 12, right? You know, like Jesus developed a strategy of delegation, investing in the Timothys of his day in order to make disciples of people from the future. It's sort of like a, you know, passing on that Olympic torch to the next person. And quite frankly, I don't think this mission came as any surprise to Timothy because he had already seen Paul do the same thing with Titus, with Tychicus, with uh, Trophimus, Teratitus, Erastus. Some of those names are pretty difficult to, uh, to pronounce, but uh, John, Mark, Luke, and others. So we see this mission. Now, I, uh, last December, I turned 60. And that's the moment where you say, oh, wow, you don't, really don't look that age. But uh, anyway, so, but, you know, I have this increasing conviction that I should be working more and more to equip others for ministry. And uh, so that's what uh, we've been doing with the Dijon church plants. So we, have a, we had a, a church plant going in North Dijon. And uh, from the beginning... I mean, the first, the first stage of leadership training is letting people lead. Good way to find out if they're leaders or not. You know, do they have anyone who follows? And so from the beginning, uh, these, uh, these three gentlemen and I, we were uh, the leadership team. And you can tell that, you know, some are more courageous than others. And uh, now, it, it, you know, uh, I shared in the Sunday school hour that so after five years, we have decided to discontinue. Uh, this church plant, okay? So it's, it's, it's actually very hard for us, those who uh, were part of that team and we invested ourselves. Uh, Bruce, um, right here, uh, he and I, we had coffee just a couple weeks ago and we were both sort of crying in our coffee, you know, about this. Uh, very difficult, but the encouraging thing is that the, uh, the, the mother church, the East Dijon church, you know, there we want to see more elders and deacons come into the team. And these three men are being considered for eldership and for uh, the, the deacon responsibilities. Good men. They have been leading practically. And then we had a second phase of leading. And this was practical skill training, both men and women leaders. People who showed potential, who aspired to that. Uh, Frank, our pastor, Louise and I, we were doing the teaching on this. And so, so the people represented were from the East Dijon Church, the North Dijon Church, the cafe, the InterVarsity uh, student group, and even the Baptist Church pastor was there because we worked closely with them. And so there were seven sessions uh, dealing with character, teamwork. Uh, when you, as soon as you talk about teamwork, then you might as well talk about conflict resolution because it's, it you know, typically happens. But delegation, multiplication of leaders, all right? So actual hands-on training by leading, then skill training, and then a third component was, uh, was this group. It got dubbed Disco Theo. Uh, okay, so that didn't mean like disco, you know, uh, Bee Gees, that kind of thing, but discussion, theological discussion. And so we uh, simply took a systematic theology book written by a French professor in Paris read a chapter every month, get together and we talk about it. And, you know, I would, um, I would just set up sometimes debates. Uh, sometimes we would uh, do question and answer. They would each have to take a topic and give a quick presentation and then field the questions that other people had about it. It was very dialogical, uh, very interactive. And so, but through these things, you know, the, uh, the intent was to raise up people for ministry all kinds of needs in ministry, whether it be youth group, house group leaders, uh, leading uh, discovery groups or discipleship groups, or, you know, uh, the, uh, being deacons and elders. Uh, as a church planting team, we need evangelists, so we need church planters. So, you know, preparing people for ministry, and quite frankly, regardless of the generation. 
God opened a door too. Um, so I was asked to teach a course on transcultural evangelism at the Geneva Bible Institute. These people had all uh, already been, uh, they had done a year of internship in Africa. And so we got together and I was sharing with them just uh, about presenting Jesus, the good news is found in Jesus, salvation by, by grace through faith. That never changes, but the way that we might present that to uh, someone from Marion, Ohio, certainly isn't the way that I would present it to a person in Dijon, France, and uh, probably not the way that one might present it to a Muslim in Kyrgyzstan or an animist in Vietnam or a sorcerer in the Cameroon. Transcultural evangelism. How do we share this good news of Jesus to people from very different backgrounds with very different ways of understanding things? And so, you know, Louise and I were, were just thankful to God. It, it's uh, quite humbling to see the doors that he has opened to us for ministry, but to, to train others who will impact people that we will never even meet. People from the future. And so on the back of those cards, once again, you know, if you uh, see things or, you know, um, uh, and mention things that you think, yeah, I'd really like to pray for that. We, we would appreciate it because, uh, you know, God is the one who is at work and he does that through the prayers of his people. Paul's strategy was to impact future generations by investing in Timothy. And quite frankly, this isn't the, the first time we see it in scripture. It's a major theme uh, in scripture. Uh, Genesis 2.4. Let's, let's start way back at the beginning says, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth. There's a Hebrew word that means generations of, and it's actually the, um, the organizing structure of the book of Genesis. And so we see these are the generations of the heavens and the earth. Uh, 5.1, these are the generations of Adam. 6.9, these are the generations of Noah. We're starting to get the point. 37.2, these are the generations of Jacob. And it, it's not predominantly about that particular person, as important as that person was, but it's the people are going to follow. The next, the posterity of those people. And why is that? Because, it, you know, the focus is on the people of God. The focus is on the lineage of Jesus. And so, you know, we see the I, First Chronicles, uh, you know, probably no one's favorite book. It's got all these lists and these genealogies, but beginning of Matthew, genealogies, Gospel of Luke, genealogies. Why are they there? Because people matter to God. And God thinks in generations. Those are people for whom Jesus died. People whom God loved, who God loves. And so uh, Jim Peterson, he uh, was at a seminar with him. He's a vice president for the Navigators. And uh, he said, if we do not think generationally, we're not in harmony with God. Because we see the generations in this book, through time, people for whom Jesus died. Now, John and Sherry, uh, right now they're, they're thinking generationally. And so um, this is uh, the new director, Ethan of the chateau. He started on November 1st and his wife Jessie and their, their daughter Eleanor. And uh, John and Sherry's new boss is uh, 26 years old. Who? Okay. So what do you think? Uh, what, what's their attitude going to be? Is it going to be like this? And don't tell them I showed this picture, please. You know, but is, is this their attitude? <laughs> 26 years old. This is not going to work. You know, or, by the way, they say hi, and John wants me to say all kinds of really good things about him. Uh, you know, <laughs> and, I, and I will, because they're fantastic. Or I'm quite convinced it's this, because I've talked to them. And they're thrilled to have Ethan and Jesse there. And I'm thrilled that John and Sherry are there, because, yeah, Ethan, I mean, he's, he's got um, a, uh, he's, he's very bright. He's very talented. He's got heart, he's got enthusiasm, he's got ideas. John and Sherry, they've got experience. They've got wisdom. They know how to work with people. And uh, so as I shared in the, um, in the first hour, we also have a uh, three, yeah, we've, we've got three young people under 30 who are now joining the Chateau board. And so lots of enthusiasm and energy. 
But John and Sherry, they're the, they're the pillars there. They're the ones who have the experience. John's, John's the shepherd. He can keep people together. They're the ones who, you know, they, I mean, young people just, sorry, but, you know, say stupid things, insensitive things. <laughs> Old people do too, all right? You know, it's, and, but they can handle it. They, they just absorb this stuff and, you know, they love people. They are critical to that ministry. And they are really, e even though Ethan is the director of the chateau, John and Sherry are the, the heart of the ministry there. And those young people can count on them and their wisdom and experience. So pray for them. Uh, this is a critical time. We've got a bright future for the chateau. Uh, pray uh, for protection on the team because there's been spiritual battle there. There's been division. Uh, pray for John and Sherry uh, as they, they work with these, like they're all under 30. Uh, and uh, all that entails generations. But a uh, really bright future for the Chateau, and they, they will share more about that with you uh, in just a few days. We want to uh, impact people from the future by equipping gifted servants today, regardless of their age. And so in Ephesians 4, we see, And Christ gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And so, yeah, it's implied that these people are going to do those ministries of starting churches and uh, challenging people and sharing Christ. But here he gives the purpose, purpose for which Christ gave them to the church. It's to make the church ready to equip people for the work of ministry. And so equip means to prepare or it's the completion of something that's already good. That's what equip means. You know, okay, we've got a good start. Let, let's, let's keep going. Let's, let's see it become mature. And so um, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers are to prepare disciples to serve just as they themselves serve. Not in the same way, not in the same capacity, but in ways that the whole church can be more involved in. In the areas of church planting, when we think of prophecy, sometimes that can be... But uh, prophecy, think uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 3, where it says that they exhort, they encourage, the prophets exhort, encourage, and comfort. Okay, teaching the church to do those things. The evangelists sharing the gospel, shepherds caring for people, teachers faithfully teaching the word. Christian Schwartz, he is a, uh, a German sociologist. He did a study on a thousand churches around the world. Uh, trying to find out what, what are some of the aspects of, of growing churches. And one of the things that he came out with was, he said, the true fruit of an apple tree is not one apple but another tree. The fruit of an evangelist is not a person's conversion, but other evangelists. That's what, that's what uh, Ephesians 4 is saying. Yes, you know, the evangelist is supposed to share the gospel, but the evangelist is also to train others to share the gospel. And that's an important factor in planting churches, he says. And so for these gifted people, they're supposed to, yes, use their gifts, reproduce other gifted servants, and equip all disciples to serve. And by reproducing gifted servants, then apostle, prophet, evangel, shepherd, teacher, they impact people from the future by investing in disciples today. Example. Daji Samuel. He, uh, he was an apostle, church planter, uh, did a phenomenal work in the Chad. Okay? And so uh, he, was, uh, that, he, he lived in southern Chad. He um, was at his house just uh, last year. And uh, he was going into the Sudan. We saw that in the film this morning. Heavily Muslim area. As he was going on a three-day exploratory trip, he fell sick with fever and died in the desert. Like that. Unexpected. Totally unexpected. And uh, Frank Pula, he's our Africa director. He and the leaders in Chad, they were wondering, well, is, is this the end of uh, church planting for Chad? What is going to happen without Daje? Happily, Daje had invested himself heavily in these two men, this is Justin, and this is Paul. Okay, Paul, he, he calls himself Paul from the bush. 
Okay, so we, as we got talking, you know, he was Paul from the bush, I was Paul from the city. All right, and uh, we, we hit it off really, really well. Love the guy. And so Paul was sharing with me about Dajay's training. He said they would, uh, they would get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. Okay, so already who's ready to sign up for training with Dajay? And, you know, so they would get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. They would share and pray for their personal needs. Uh, he, Dajay would share the word with them while they were working, while they were getting cleaned up, while they were training. Paul said that every occasion was good for sharing and training for Dajay. On the weekends, they would go out into the villages. Daji would preach the first part of the message. Paul would preach the second part. Uh, Daji taught Paul what to look for among disciples. So yeah, look for people who have talents and gifts. Who can sing? Who's a good singer? Who's got a good voice? Who, who prays? Like everybody prays, but, you know, but more than the others who really have a heart for that ministry. Uh, who, who's a good speaker, a preacher? Who's the one who's out there always talking to people about Jesus, the evangelist? And so Daji taught him how to identify those gifts and those kinds of people. And Daji, by interacting with Justin and Paul, he reproduced himself in those men. Today, the, uh, the, the church, it, it's actually become a church planting movement. Okay, so um, uh, Justin was sharing with us this is, these are, that's his name right there, Justin. And so these were his disciples, uh, Jean, uh, well, John, Nestor, Michelle, and Timothy. And then these people are their disciples and their disciples, it just, just kept going. And so today, Paul and Justin, they lead a church planting team in the Chad that they've, they've got 98 church planters. They've got over 100 churches started. And they have reached, we talk about people groups, they have reached these 18 people groups. And it's just a phenomenal thing. This is part of our family. Something that God has been doing. And uh, this is in uh, south, so it's, it's southeastern Chad where it touches on the Central African Republic and the Sudan. And there's church planting going on in that whole region. People coming to Christ, places where you and I cannot go. Okay. They, they would literally kill us, all right? Um, but they can, and they are, and they're seeing people come to Christ there. And so, f um, you know, Frank Poole and I, we went there. I mean, if they're doing all this, you know, well, why do they need us? <laughs> uh, well, we brought these African leaders together uh, because uh, in talking with Paul, he said, well, you know, I said, well, how, how do you stay sharp now that Dudge is no longer here? And he said, well, it's by getting together with the other African church planting leaders. So we brought them together in Yaoundé, so this was last March, and uh, they shared with us, I took 16 pages of notes, I mean this was, this was like a, a doctoral course in, in uh, African missiology, and there's, you know, how do they share the gospel with Muslims, how do they share the gospel with uh, animists, how do they share the gospel with sorcerers, uh, how are they planting churches, and, and all of these things uh, they were sharing with us, and uh, then Afterward, you know, they, uh, they invited me uh, and obviously Frank to, to come back and do some equipping with them because, you know, once again, uh, you know, they are out doing that work, but they, they really do need people from the outside to help them, okay, so to keep them motivated, encouraged, and to be able to go deeper. Well, we're talking about how to train people from other generations, but also other places. I said, you know, so we took uh, Paul and Justin aside, and I said, look, I, there is hardly a worse mismatch here between, you know, Paul from the city and what you, Paul, are doing out in the bush. Uh, you know, they learn by, through stories. I mean, they, 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 they share stories orally. I learn by reading. You know, they're very concrete in, in uh, what they do and how they do it. I, I like concepts and, and theories. And things. But as we talked about it, you know, they, they felt that, um, you know, uh, I, Franck, and a uh, gentleman, Augustin Ibele, uh, would have something to offer. And so the plan is for us to go back and uh, do a third uh, level of training. Right now they have, it's, it's called the School of Evangelism, where they learn how to share the gospel. Okay. They have a school of missiology where they learn how to start churches. And so the idea is that, uh, you know, we'll share some missiological concepts 
okay, so that, and to go deeper into the Word so that they, in turn, can take those things and share them with their church planters. The how-to that we can never do. So it's not, we're not transmitting how we do things in France, but rather what does the Word say and what are some of these principles that maybe you could take now and impact others with it. And so in that way, uh, God's opened a door you know, to allow me maybe to impact people whom I'll never meet. That's what we want to be doing. And to make followers of Jesus today by investing in people today. You know that passage well. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. D. A. Carson, and I believe that you have this in your notes, and he says, disciples are those who hear, understand, and obey Jesus' teaching is binding on all Jesus' disciples to make others what they themselves are. Disciples of Christ. See, and, and so the, uh, uh, I wanted to highlight what he says because this, this making disciples and reproducing ourselves is not just for teachers. I mean, that's the point of 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, the teachers. But it's not just, you know, for Pastor John or Pastor Jim or new pastor, you fill in the blank. It's not just for missionary Paul. It's for everybody. It's for every one of you to be investing yourselves in the lives of others. That's what disciples do. Okay, now, Ruth. There's the book of Ruth uh, in the Old Testament, four chapters. Just a, a, an unremarkable woman, really. I mean, what, what did she do? Did she do any miracles? To, was she a great teacher? No. Why is it there? What, what is amazing about Ruth? What is she known for? Who was she? Yeah, she was a good wife. She was a faithful wife. Entrust the word to faithful people. We see that faithfulness in the life of Ruth. Okay? And it finishes off the book. And what's, what's the very next book? What's the next story that we see? It's about little Davy. Davy, the son of Jesse. He was the runt of the litter. He was the youngest. Ruth was his great grandmother. That, that model of faithfulness was part of David's heritage. And she impacted David through that heritage, that faithfulness of following God with all her heart, soul, mind, and strength. And by doing that, she impacted all of us because we see David as a model, a man after God's own heart. And so this impacting future generations is also for grandmothers, great-grandmothers, grandfathers, great-grandfathers, and every disciple of Christ. Because remember, you know, young people, Ruth was a teenager when that story started. Okay, so for you millennials, this is for you too. In the Dijon church right now, we're trying to mobilize uh, university students to work with the youth group and to teach Sunday school because impacting future generations is for all of us. All right, we're going to wrap this up. And obviously now, you know, you understand the importance of generations and we want to be thinking generationally. One of the problems that we face is that there are just so many demands and there's so much that we want to do and there's so much that is expected of us and we're just so blasted busy, you know, that it, it's sometimes hard to think about those other people. And then doing ministry here, I mean, you have responsibilities in the church and I've got missional tasks. Uh, you know, we want to do those things well, but... We need to remember the people around us in those generations. Um, some of you know the name Tom Julian. Uh, he was one of the people who heavily impacted Louise and myself. Still, I've um, just been emailing with him recently. He's probably about 86 years old right now and still going strong. Um, but, uh, you know, when he, uh, at one point, he was the director of the mission and he was reevaluating things and he had concluded that he wanted to invest himself because just imagine, you know, director of a mission uh, working around the world and then there are all the uh, 
uh, you know, responsibilities, churches, finances, and things like that. But he decided that he wanted to invest himself in God, three eternal, three eternal things, God, God's word, and people. There's wisdom there. And we too, we want to invest ourselves in people. Not just doing tasks, but also following Paul's example for impacting future generations. What you've heard from me, and trust the faithful men and women who will be able to teach others also. And I think Timothy, he was, um, ah, there's Carson's quotes. Uh, and, uh, but Timothy, he was sort of like a pebble or maybe a, a small stone that was thrown into a lake, you know, and so there's that ripple effect. And Paul invested himself in Timothy and the ripple effect, I mean, this just, his strategy worked. Here we are 21 centuries later and we are benefiting from Timothy's faithfulness in transmitting the word to the next generation as Paul did to Timothy. And we want to do the same. It doesn't appear that Paul insisted on how Timothy should do things. How Timothy equipped others. I mean, in my mind, Paul was kind of like a boomer. You know, he was just an action man. He was going everywhere, doing everything. And Timothy seemed more millennial to me, more laid back, you know, more holistic. And it, but the, the how part did not matter because Paul was interested in Timothy's life with God and his faithfulness to the word and his love for people. And uh, he wasn't going to minister in the same way that Paul did. Clear, clear from what we read. But Paul just insisted on the essentials. His life of faith, his attitude of love, his intentionality in sharing the word with others. Now, you know, for you, think about your new pastor. I don't know. You don't know what generation he'll be from. But I would encourage you to really consider somebody who can reach the youngest among you. To reach the next generation around you. And uh, not, not the pastor who's, yeah, you know, he'll be good for me. This is, this is not all about me, you know, but it's about those next generations, the people for whom Jesus died. Think about John and Sherry. Pray for them because they're doing that with Ethan, with Jesse, you know, with those new people on the board because, you know, they want to in, impact future generations there in France as well. And it's not just for Pastor John. It's not just for Sherry. It's not just for your new pastor or for me, but it's for all of us, regardless of our age. This is part of the Bible's teaching for the followers of Jesus. So, the question is, who might you invest in today, tomorrow, or next week? It might be someone older, might be someone younger, might be someone from your own generation. That's not the point. The point is investing ourselves in people. The person might be like you, might not might have the same personality, different personality, different gift. That's it, not the point. Investing ourselves in others is a way that we can impact future generations for people, future generations for Jesus today. Let's pray. Lord, thanks for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for Paul, his faithfulness, for Timothy, for his faithfulness. We thank you for John and Cherry, their faithfulness how they've impacted these people here, how they're impacting people now in France. And uh, we do pray for them that uh, they would ha be a strong influence in Ethan's life, in Jesse's life, uh, in others around them. And we pray that you would do the same with us, that we would be faithful, that we would uh, invest ourselves in the lives of people for your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.